Welcome to the program. I'm Jeff Shackman. Once upon a time, we didn't have to even think about political correctness, and we survived as a culture. We self-corrected. We became more sensitive to others. We learned to accept and appreciate diversity. It was sometimes difficult, painful, but a lot of it was organic. Often we slipped up, we fell backwards, and sometimes it even took appropriate legislation to provide better guardrails for our behavior. Such was the forward march of mankind. But today the bludgeon of political correctness hangs over all of us, and nowhere worse than on our college campuses. The fear of free speech, the absurdity of safe spaces, the desire to silence unpopular ideas, and the seeking out of problems and conflicts that don't really exist are all hallmarks of where we are today. But how did we get here? And is there a path out that doesn't divide us still further, polarize us even more, and further enhance the sanctimony of those who consider their ideas singularly virtuous? We're going to talk about that today with my guest, Professor Robert Boyers. Robert Boyers is a professor of English at Skidmore College and the director of the New York Summer Writers Institute. He's the author of 10 previous books and the editor of dozens of others. It is my pleasure to welcome Robert Boyers here to talk about the tyranny of virtue, identity, the academy, and the hunt for political heresies. Robert Boyers, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Well, it's great to have you here. As we look at this way in which particularly political correctness on our college campuses and the limiting of free speech in those places has overwhelmed us today. Is there a tipping point? Is there something we can point to when the situation got as bad as it is today? Uh, it's hard to identify a single moment. Um, the, this, this sort of tendency that I sort of try to uh, describe in my book um, has been with us in one way or another for, I would say, about 30 years in the late 1980s. Um, we had a number of, of books, generally from people on the political right, uh, talking about uh, the growing uh, sort of phenomenon that, uh, that at that time at least seemed very new. I'm talking about uh, books like Alan Bloom's The Closing right. of the American Mind, um, that, that sort of thing. But really uh, what was being um, this described in those days has turned into something very different, which is to say it is now entrenched um, in colleges and universities to an extraordinary degree. Um, divisions have grown up in, in colleges and universities, uh, offices, uh, human resources offices, which have dozens of people working in them, even, uh, even at very small colleges like my own, um, where um, there are bias response teams uh, set in place to hunt out um, even the slightest kinds of deviations from the approved or accredited line. Um, speech crimes, um, and I'm not talking about anything uh, grotesque or incendiary, uh, but the, uh, the misuse of certain terms, um, well, the use of common terms in the language um, can become an occasion for uh, a full-blown case, a bias case in which professors or students are brought up on charges. And, and that's the sort of thing I'm describing. And, and how did we get to this point? How did it get so bad in your view? Well, I think um, in, in so many, it's hard, you know, it's hard again to, to identify a particular moment, but, uh, but I do think it is the case that in uh, a great many of the colleges and universities where you see this sort of thing, the professoriate tends to be, as I am, um, liberal. Um, left liberal, um, and uh, and to have an interest in um, contemporary issues, uh, an interest in in politics, and a desire in some way to make the world a better place, um, but they don't really have the means for doing that, or the appetite for doing it. They don't really have the appetite for struggle out in the real world, and so they've turned uh, inward. Um, and they've decided to make uh, the campus itself 
uh, a a ground in which um, to to create a kind of uniformity, uh, a kind of an idealistic world in which uh, nobody says the wrong thing and nobody thinks the wrong thoughts and nobody assigns the wrong books, and uh, and and that's I think where we get the problem, uh, the notion that uh, that there is somehow uh, on campus. Uh, a place where not only can you um, can you uh, promote these kinds of values and virtues, but where you can find a ready population of students who will follow your lead and adopt the virtues that you tell them to adopt. And and that's a sort of a heady experience for a lot of people, and uh, and they can't they they can't stop uh, working at it. What is the nexus, as you see it, between what we see going on on college campuses, that this epidemic of, of political correctness, and identity politics in the larger body politic in the country? Well, identity politics, you know, I think it has a lot to do with the kind of thing that I'm uh, describing or attempting to, to describe in my book. Um, obviously, it's rooted in the concern with identity, and that's a concern which inevitably you're going to have um, when more and more you diversify a campus. You're bringing together people from many different ethnicities, uh, religious backgrounds, uh, genders, and so on. And uh, and obviously they're all going to be in one degree or another concerned with uh, who and what they are, what kinds of relations they they wish to have with people who belong to other groups. Completely, completely understandable. And uh, and of course it's not as if identity is a subject that's ever been far uh, from our minds over the course of the last oh I don't know 50 years or so. But identity politics is something else, right? Because in identity politics, you have um, an uh, attempt um, to, um, for people of a particular race, religion, ethnicity, gender, or social orientation to form exclusive political alliances uh, and to move away from broad-based coalitions. Um, and this, of course, can feel very heady and empowering uh, for people who are involved in that. And again, it seems to me entirely legitimate for a population that's been uh, discriminated against uh, to uh, to get together, to mobilize with uh, with people of the same kind, and to try to uh, change the laws, uh, change the, the the protocols and decorums uh, at an institution on a campus. Entirely understandable. But there are insidious features of uh, this tendency towards uh, identity politics. And I think the most insidious is the idea that fundamentally people of a particular kind tend to be, ought to be, must be, like-minded. Um, that they must see and feel things more or less in the same way. And with that, you get sort of demands for uniformity within a particular group and demands for uniform responses towards that group um, when they interact with people outside uh, of, of their group. So in that sense, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm Jew, I'm a Jew, uh, I have a Jewish background, and uh, I'm expected to think and to feel the way a Jew is supposed to think and feel. Um, people believe that, certain people believe that, um, if you ask me questions about uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in the Middle East, I'm supposed to think about that and talk about it the way a person of my background should talk about such a thing. Um, and this just seems to me uh, an absurd uh, and uh, and really dangerous way to sort of think about uh, identity and groups. Um, obviously, I'm a Jew, but I'm also a left liberal, I'm working class, <clears throat> I'm an intellectual, um, I'm straight, uh, I'm married, uh, I have children, I live in the Northeast, I've spent my life on a college campus, uh, I'm not just a Jew. Um, and in that sense, the way I think about any issue <clears throat> will have something to do with all of the different identities that 
uh, that go into making me the person I am. And exactly in the same way, if we talk about the correct way for a black person to think about, I don't know, affirmative action or something like that, seems to me absurd and dangerous. I mean, there are a lot of different ways of thinking about uh, affirmative action, uh, and those different ways are legitimate for different kinds of black people. So I think that's one of the main areas in which we've, I think, gotten ourselves in trouble uh, by thinking about ourselves as a sort of fixed um, in our identities and required uh, to sort of hold the line uh, when it comes to expressing our views on important issues. To what extent is there the realization anywhere that this point of view, although put forth by liberals, put forth by those with arguably a liberal and or progressive attitude, is anything but that it is repressive in so many ways? Well, yeah, I, I, I think it is, and, uh, and, and yet <clears throat> I see it and hear it all the time. Uh, I, I hear it in the same way um, uh, as a set of demands put to liberals uh, to think about diversity um, in a particular way, uh, which means to think about it um, as a diversity of skin color or sexual or gender orientation, um, but not to think about it as diversity of viewpoint. Uh, diversity of viewpoint is uh, basically a notion that liberals nowadays are more and more um, encouraged not to entertain. Um, simply because it suggests that you're, if you do, that you're not going to sort of be on board with uh, the principles that liberals are is supposed to espouse. You're not going to be thinking about uh, affirmative action in the correct liberal way. And, uh, and that, that just seems to me, again, something I more and more observe in the ordinary course of affairs on my own campus and on the many other campuses that I visit as an invited lecturer or speaker. Does it seem to be getting worse on campuses today as you see it? Well, yes, I, I do think it is, and uh, I, I, I see it all the time, again, even in, in the smallest ways, the tendency to, on those uh, canvases to sort of call people out, to shame them, um, to accuse them of, uh, well, such things as privilege uh, or white privilege seems to me to have grown to a dangerous degree. Uh, in, my, in my book, I, I offer uh, all sorts of, of uh, anecdotes and stories um, right out of my own experience where, where I see this. Uh, and, uh, and it's quite extraordinary as I think about the, the full range of these things. I'll give you just a couple of, of brief uh, examples. Um, recently, which is say last, uh, last winter, uh, at my school we were conducting uh, a search uh, for, to hire a new faculty member in my department. And, um, and we brought four finalists to the campus. Um, and uh, they were all quite extraordinary. Um, and one of them was uh, a young man in his mid-30s, very distinguished, the author of two brilliant uh, novels. Um, and uh, in the course of his day with us, we were looking him over for a day. Uh, he met 25 faculty members, uh, each, each of us for a few minutes. Um, he met lots of students. He went upstairs and met the deans of the college and so on. And late in the afternoon, he gave a kind of a demonstration class and afterwards um, the faculty observing his demonstration class were uh, invited to ask him questions which we did and he did something rather surprising took us very much aback um, he called each of us when we raised our hands by our first name which seemed extraordinary because um, he had just met us and, and met us very briefly and again there were 25 of us that he met over the course of that morning uh, and this was in the late afternoon and uh, I raised my hand he called me Bob that was sort of took me aback um, at a certain point um, he confused the names of two faculty members um, who are Asian American he called one by the name of the other and so on and the next day uh, when our department met um, 
our department chair, backed by most of the people in the room, though not by me, um, indicated that this seemed to her uh, an unforgivable offense, um, very painful um, and hurtful to the people whose names had been confused, and announced that so far as she was concerned, uh, this person was no longer a viable candidate for the position. Yeah. Now, I, I mean, that just seemed to me extraordinary. Um, I mean, here uh, a person had um, had simply made a mistake. Um, you know, and you might say an unfortunate mistake, but a mistake on the basis of which you could read what um, into it. Um, could you declare on that basis that this person was an awful person? Could you declare that he was a racist? You knew very little about him. Uh, you knew very little about his background. All you knew was that he was uh, a distinguished writer, a young person whose recommendations were stellar. And suddenly he was eliminated from the running because he had confused the names of two people. And this seems to me, I mean, it's a small thing. It's trivial in a way, but it is a mark of the kind of thing I see more and more. It is a form of intolerance. We say our own virtue requires, our sense of our own virtue requires that we not be forgiving, that we not be understanding, that we be intolerant even when we're confronted with a mistake. What it does is it feeds into the whole idea of stereotyping and is antithetical to our ability to really understand each other at the deepest level. Well, yes, exactly. And, uh, and, and in fact, um, what, what you see more and more is a desire, um, a very odd desire, uh, coming from people on the liberal left, uh, that we not um, make strenuous efforts to understand each other. Um, the writer Roxane Gay, who has considerable influence in the culture, um, wrote um, not long ago, this, uh, this, this, this past summer, that we are required, all of us, to stay in your lane, which means basically um, not to become involved in thinking about, writing about, teaching, talking about the lives of people different from oneself. Um, she was talking about the efforts of a poet um, in The Nation magazine um, to um, evoke the experience of a black person. This is a white poet to evoke the experience of a black person uh, and in so doing to use the language of um, a certain kind of, of sort of black community. Um, the black linguist John McWhorter, writing about this very thing, said, whatever you make of the poem, whether you think it's a successful poem or not, um, the language used um, to express, uh, to, you, uh, to evoke the language of, of that kind of black person was, I quote, spot on, a uh, very precise use of the language. Roxanne Gay's um, response to this was, no, a white person has no business even attempting to do that sort of thing, and uh, stay in your lane is the message we are we are to take. And uh, I, I mean, I, you may have heard a bit about that, that uh, incident of the poem, which was published in the Nation magazine, immediately pulled from the pages of the Nation by the two poetry editors who had accepted the poem. Um, when when uh, complaints of the sort voice, voiced by Roxane Gay emerged, um, and they apologized profusely, um, for having accepted the poem and published it. And again, this, this is the sort of thing that more and more uh, we see in not only academic life, but in uh, the publishing world, um, where, for example, publishers will, will tell you um, that um, they, have, they have been informing agents not to send them novels um, by people of one color or another that deal with uh, the lives of people who are different from the author of those books, um, that this is illegitimate. So we're basically creating a situation in which people are told not even to try um, to imagine or penetrate the lives of people different from themselves. This is, this is going to have an effect um, on the way that young people write novels and poems on the way that uh, teachers 
select books to teach in their classes, and I find it most unfortunate, and it's one of the primary reasons that I felt I had to write this book. Talk a little bit about what happens to those, be they faculty or be they students, that push back against these excessive norms. Well, you know, it, uh, obviously it does vary from, uh, from one place uh, to another. Um, I, I mean, I've, I've witnessed it uh, in, in my own uh, classroom. I mean, I've, I've, I've been teaching for a very long time. Uh, I, I'm, I'm in my 51st year teaching at Skidmore College, and I uh, can say, and I say it not with pride, in some cases I say it with uh, amazement, I've never been brought up on charges by anyone for anything, for violating anything. But I have witnessed in my own uh, class, uh, in numbers of my classes, um, very unpleasant altercations in which a student um, has said something which other students disapprove of and which, and of course, in, in some ways, that's just what you want in a classroom. You want to have some uh, willingness to debate and struggle. But frequently, the thing uh, that students um, uh, uh, amount to and uh, the, the things that students say, which other students complain about, is simply a word. Um, a simple word. I mean, and, and this, of course, is true of faculty members as well. Um, uh, a couple of weeks ago in the New York Times, the black writer Walter Mosley uh, published an op-ed in which he talked about um, one of his own uh, recent classes in which he read out from a text he was teaching in the class the N-word. He didn't use the N-word himself. He read it out. He quoted it in a text he was uh, teaching. And uh, there were students in his class who were so offended by his doing that, uh, in spite of the fact that their professor was, was a black man himself. Uh, Walter Mosey says in the essay, you know, I, I am the N-word, um, uh, that they brought him up on charges. Um, and, uh, and those charges were taken seriously at the institution where he was teaching. The same sort of thing occurred um, uh, this past spring uh, in a class uh, taught by a woman named Lori Sheck at the New School for Social Research, a graduate course in which she was teaching a work by James Baldwin, um, in which she read out uh, the N-word uh, and asked her, her graduate class to think about Baldwin's use uh, of that word in which case she was called out, brought up on bias charges uh, for creating a hostile environment in her classroom, suspended from her teaching, and subjected to an investigation. In the end, um, she was exonerated and allowed to go back to her teaching this fall, but this is a, a sort of a sign of the kind of thing that's happening all over the country uh, in classrooms of many different kinds. And I must say, um, it, it seems to me very unfortunate. Do we have enough evidence? Has this been going on long enough that we can look at those students in particular who have adopted this attitude within the confines of the academy and can we understand how they have carried this with them into the real world after their academic experience, into the workplace or into their lives, and how it's impacted that? Well, you know, I, uh, I do, I have lots of uh, former students uh, who've, you know, who've graduated and, and gone on into the work world. Um, my wife and I are very close to a number of uh, students who, um, who've graduated over the course of the last couple of decades. Uh, they live in New York City, and as we're in New York City um, at least a couple of weekends a month, we, we see them uh, all the time, see them socially. Um, and, uh, and they tell us that um, at their places of work, some of the, some of the time in, in publishing houses, uh, but some of the time in corporate offices and so on, uh, they do see this kind of thing manifested, but uh, principally in mm, conversations over a lunch table or over a dinner table, which is to say that outside the academy, in, in what is sometimes referred to as the real world, um, I think it's much harder than it is uh, in uh, in the university and college world um, to become uh, vocal about these kinds of complaints. 
uh, just because people have other things on their mind uh, and because they have other work to do and other business to do, and they're not invested in the same degree, in the same way, in cleansing the common language and uh, constantly making people feel uncomfortable about the things they say. So I think the tendency to call people out and shame them uh, for what are essentially uh, trivial violations of protocol, um, violations of one or another speech code, that this, this tendency is rather limited outside the confines of the campus. Professor Robert Boyers, his book is The Tyranny of Virtue, Identity, the Academy, and the Hunt for Political Heresies. Robert, I thank you so much for spending time with us. Oh, I'm delighted. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Thank you.